Yeah. Okay, so it looks like somebody asked, are these uh, every Tuesday? They are. My, my painting ones are every Tuesday and the drawing ones are every Wednesday. Is it tomorrow? I think that's I right. I believe it's Wednesday, yes. Yeah, so the, both of these um, more instructional uh, videos uh, highlighting uh, basically dry media like charcoal and pencils and things like that. Um, they're with Adrian, I think her name is. And then uh, I'm on Tuesdays with painting media, uh, watercolor, oils, acrylics, and variations thereof. Okay, so we are going to do a demonstration involving uh, watercolor today. And I have a nice little painting that we're going to work with. I wanna show you, um, I'm just gonna to go to the overhead scene here. We're gonna be working on that painting. This is a painting by an artist named Emil Nolda. And I just wanna go over the supplies. I don't have my usual uh, photo for this because I just had it set up for the uh, uh, oils. Um, but if you've got a little tray like this, a little palette, that'd be great. Um, if you've just got a sheet of wax paper, that will also uh, work fine for squirting out uh, paints if you've got tubes, or if you've got one of these uh, like trays of watercolor, these work great. Um, I have here this vast array of colors that is the Artist Loft stuff. Um, these three trays, I think were like 10 bucks or something like that. They're sort of entry level, you know, just sort of get your feet wet with watercolor kind of thing. Um, so watercolors, uh, the tray, you're gonna need a thing of water. You're gonna need some watercolor brushes. Um, and there is a difference between watercolor brushes and acrylic and oil brushes. Um, so you'll want to uh, make sure that you uh, ideally have watercolor brushes. Um, and I'll just give you a, a quick word about how that works. Um, these are the brushes I've been using uh, in, in prior weeks here, these, this sort of light handled one. Um, this is meant for uh, oils or acrylics. Um, and, and, a, and a quick and easy way to, to find that out is you see how, how that springs back. It's really, it's kind of more of a rigid uh, fiber. Um, th that's great because you wanna kind of have a little bit of resistance with, with the, uh, the acrylics uh, or oils. Um, the watercolor brushes are a little bit softer. Um, they're generally uh, a little bit finer even, um, and they're designed to absorb water. They kind of, they're kind of like sponges in that way. Um, you know, sometimes some, some people even use kind of sponge brushes. Um, I'm not a big fan of them, uh, but these do act in a very absorbent manner. So watercolor brushes, if you've only got acrylic or oil type brushes, they will work. Um, but ideally, watercolor brushes is what uh, is what you're after. So um, paints, tray, water, brushes, and of course the eponymous or the uh, ever-present uh, towels, paper towels. I got to roll over here just in case it really gets crazy. Um, but that's that's kind of uh, the the basics of of watercolor. Watercolor is a really awesome media because you, it's super portable. You can just throw them in your backpack or you know even your back pocket. I mean, this little this little thing here is basically the size of a wallet. Um, so these are are really handy um, for you know road trips or you know if you're someday when we all get to go where we usually go, um, watercolors are a good one to take with you. Um, okay, um, and you'll also notice here that I have watercolor paper. Um, that's the one thing about watercolor that uh, is, is kind of a must have. Uh, you can get away with cutting a little corners and some of the other materials you can use, you know, good paints, tray paints, tube paints. But with watercolor, you really need an absorbent paper. They have been making these uh, boards that are uh, like aqua board, I think is, a, is one that's, a, 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 the brand is I think ampersand. And they've been making these aqua boards. I've got a, a friend who uses them and loves them. Uh, they're a little bit more spendy, but watercolor paper is, is sort of the tried and true uh, surface that you paint on. And it is, uh, it's just a little heavier stock. It's got the perfect uh, amount of what's called sizing. Sizing is uh, stuff that you put in paper to sort of prevent it from absorbing too much water. 
you know, if you're familiar with like tissue paper or toilet paper, something like that, you put water on there and it just sucks it right up. This does, but it's a little bit more controlled. It doesn't have that super absorbency that a lot of uh, sort of lower quality papers do. So watercolor paper, this is a 140 pound, um, which means it's a pretty heavy stock. So your, your standard sketchbook paper is like, like 50 or 60. This is almost three times that. So it's, it's just a, a heavier grade, heavier stock to kind of uh, stand up to the, uh, to the abuse that you're gonna put it through uh, here in a minute. Okay, so that's uh, our materials. Um, and I, you know, I encourage you to ask questions. Um, if you've got them as we go along, I will uh, try to answer them as best I can as we do that. So let's take a look at the picture we're gonna work on. This is a painting uh, by Emil Nolda who was a German slash Danish. He sort of lived up in that, the, that northern area of Germany, uh, 1867 to 1956. Um, he was part of an art movement called De Brucke, which means the bridge. Um, and it really was a transition from like the impressionist painters, like uh, you know the French impressionists like Claude Monet and Renoir and people like that. Um, into a more expressive use of color and shapes and things like that. Um, and he's one of really the first European artists to, to really kind of go hog wild and experiment with color as, a, as an expressive uh, part of, of a painting rather than just sort of a descriptive thing. You know, just, you know, you see blue sky, you paint blue sky. He would, he would sort of amplify these colors. Um, and he did, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of these little uh, floral piece pieces that that I love. They're, I mean, they're really beautiful, but they're also they take advantage of a quality of watercolor that I really want uh, you to sort of get a handle on as we're working uh, through today. Um, and and these these series of paintings are are really perfect for kind of a beginner's introduction to it. It's not it's not super complicated. They're, they're fun to paint, they're, they're beautiful to look at. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll uh, investigate Emil Nolda here. Okay, so let's get right to it, shall we? Uh, watercolor scene, there we go. Okay, so I've got my brush. I've got my tub of water over here and I'm just gonna put my, my paints over here. And what I'm gonna do is is I'm going to, I've already started it, you can see here, I've already put out some colors here. Um, and I just want to put out a few more. The good thing about watercolors is it doesn't really matter if they dry out in the tray. Like I could probably come back in a year and these paints would be perfectly fine uh, for, you know, use as long as I was able to um, kind of activate them again and and get the and get the water on there. So I'm just going to put out I've got all these colors that I've got to get just the right one for what I'm doing here. I'm just going to put out so I'll just show you how this works. I just got some red here and this this red is more of an orange. So I'm going to put out this is actually called what is this called? So you know it is called Windsor red. It's just a nice kind of stoplight, you know, really strong saturated red. And I'm gonna start with, uh, and these paints are starting to dry out on me a little bit, but there we go. It doesn't really matter. I've had paints, I've, I've had old, you know, paints that were probably older than I was um, and they were totally dry. And all you have to do is just like cut them open with an X-Acto knife. And you just put some water in there and it kind of reactivates. At a certain point, they kind of turn to dust and they're useless, but that takes a long, long time. So watercolors are, um, are very long lived if you, uh, you know, if you take care of them. I wouldn't leave them out in the hot sun every day of the year, but um, they will stand, uh, stand up to a lot, of, a lot of use. Okay, so I've done a little sketch here. You can just see the outline of it. Um, it's not detailed at all. It's just sort of a, here's one big flower, here's another big flower. If you wanna you know, just sort of sketch these out if you're working along, um, 
you know, you can kind of get, you know, there's, there's two daffodils up here and then uh, I don't know what these two orange ones are. Can't quite tell. And then it looks like a couple of poppies uh, right here. Um, so that's all I really did. And then sort of laid in some, uh, laid in some green stems. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with uh, a, a, a process uh, that a lot of people that are new to watercolor don't really know. I mean, the first instinct people have is maybe get the brush ret, get a little paint on there and start painting in there. Um, nothing wrong with that, but to take full advantage of watercolor, um, I think it's really good to introduce yourself to the concept of what's called wet into wet. And what that is, is I've just got water on here. I just put a little bit of water on my brush and all I'm going to do is I'm just going to get the area that I'm going to be painting in first damp, not soaking, but damp. So why would you do this? You would ask, well, that's a good question. And what this does is one watercolor has a reputation for being like really hard to control. Um, what this does is it immediately controls as long as I only put color in, in this, in this uh, damp area that I'm, I'm getting prepped. Uh, the, the color will only go in that damp area. And, and, you know, unless you're working upright and you're just laying tons of stuff and it drips down, I'm, I'm working flat, so it's not going to do that. But as long as you are, as long as you are diligent about really kind of controlling the edges. You can't really see what I'm doing because it's like, you know, I'm painting with invisible ink. How exciting is that? Um, I'm just dampening this red flower up here or the area of the red flower. And now I'm gonna go get my paint and I'm gonna really load it up. So I'm, I'm getting a fair amount of water and I'm just gonna load up my brush now with pigment. I'm gonna go back a few times really open this up. All right, and let's watch this because this is the coolest thing. We'll get a close up, extreme close up. Okay, now, now it's just sort of blooming in there. And the, and the, what's, what's happening is, I'm not, you notice I'm not, I'm not brushing anything on here. I'm just kind of dabbing it. And then the water is kind of taking it everywhere. And you notice that because the water is, is restricted, like I'm gonna go right up to this edge here, but it's really just gonna be the water that sort of stops my mark making. I mean, if I wanted to go further, I could sort of paint dry brush, but that kind of uh, defeats the purpose of, of this wet into wet technique. And you see how it's sort of keeping this nice little center part um, out of the picture, literally and figuratively. And I'm just doing it with just sort of a base coat of color here. I'm not really trying to mix it. It's going to be a darker red eventually, but I'll show you how you can kind of build that up. I think a lot of people come to watercolor from another type of painting, uh, like uh, acrylics or oils, and they're just used to their hand making all of the marks. So here I'm, I'm going to get rid of some of the. Uh, there's so one my, that's a, that's got a lot more water in it. Yeah, there's a question. Sorry. Yeah. Um. So what's the advantage of starting with the flower versus starting with the background first, or does it even make a difference? Um, well, it does make a difference. Um, honestly, if this were a painting that I were working on, you know, for my own, I may have started with the background. Oh, there goes my picture. Hold on. Won't take long. Um, but I, um, I really wanted to show you this technique. So it's more of a demonstration uh, preference on, on my part. Um, you certainly could have started in, in the background. Um, but where is it? Come on. But I, I wanted to, sh I wanted to show you this and this, and these flowers here really, um, 
really do the, the trick in terms of showing you that wet into wet technique. So it was, it was really kind of a conscious demonstration uh, choice on my part, if that makes sense. Makes total sense. Yeah. There we go, we're back. Okay, that's good. That was an early one. Usually it doesn't do that when I fiddle with the camera like I was. So um, you can see that that shape that I've got here is, is very specific to where that water is. You see how nice and clean this edge is right here? That's where I had put that water initially. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna firm up some of this. And it looks like there's a few different types of reds here. So I'm gonna add in another one over top of that. That was a great question, by the way, because um, you, you always want to have uh, an idea of, you know, what's most important, what's the biggest area that I can fill in. And the biggest area on this painting is the background. Um, and I will get to that. Uh, but in this particular case, it's just kind of nice to, to kind of get that big wow factor thing starting right off the bat. So I think what I'm going to do now is, is sort of see, um, actually, I think I'll leave this here. Um, cause I, what I was going to do, and I'll, I'll sort of tell you my thinking as, as I was uh, going through this, I was going to do, um, if you look up in the, the little, uh, sort of upper part of that red flower, there's kind of this dark area right in here. But if you look at that, you see how it's kind of got a nice hard edge all around it. What that tells me is that edge was created when this, uh, when that dark area was. Uh, dry. So there was no bleeding from the red to the dark red area. They're very distinct shapes. So I am going to move on uh, to another area. And that's a really important thing to get a handle on when you're working with watercolor. And especially if you're looking at uh, like a master copy to work from, um, you can see by the, the kind of marks that are on here, um, what the artist uh, did what the condition of the uh, of the paper was uh, when he painted certain things and in, in this case Emil Nolda. Um, so I am going to move on as much as I would like to show you kind of two colors going on at once here. I'm just going to move down here because um, that's a, another big area. And I'm just going to block in this orange one and I'm doing the wet into wet as well. The other thing that working wet into wet does is it sort of often creates these nice uh, textures. Um, it, it can also um, it can also make the the area that you're coloring that you're working on very uniform. Um, you know, there's not a lot of you know a little dark red, light red, whatever. It just sort of blooms and it kind of fills the area in in this nice. Uh, sort of unified way. Let's see here. Talking and painting sometimes don't go hand in hand. All right. So I'm just going to put out, I'm going to, I'm going to, I was going to say cheat, but it's not cheating. You see, there's a little red tinge to this. That's totally fine because I'm going to be going in uh, with an orange here pretty soon. Let's see, what should I use? I've got all of these colors. Um, kind of an orange, but it's kind of got, looks like it's got some white in it, which I don't like. Oh, I'll use it. Let's go with this. I'll just put a little orange out there. I could mix an orange, um, but in this case, I'm just going to, I'm just going to throw it in as it's already pre-mixed color. So I'm just doing the same thing I did there. Ooh, yeah, it's looking good. Oh Let's my get up. God. What happens if um, we ac someone accidentally drips red paint or any other color paint where you don't really want it? Is there a um, way back? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, that's why those um, uh, paper towels are super handy. You just blot them. As long as this is wet, I mean, I can, I can give you a little show and tell on that right now. Let's just say, oh, I don't, I don't want it to go down in this area. You can kind of blot get the the bulk of it up with just a little bit of blotting as long as you get the water up 
um, and it's it's damp, then um, you should be fine. If it's dry, it's not going to work. So I blotted this area, um, but that lifted up some of my water. So I got to kind of pre or re wet it. It's not really bleeding because I don't have a lot of water in here. But now that I'm over here where it's nice and damp. Yeah, these are really, this is really nice pigment. Not bad for 10 bucks or whatever it is for all those paints. All right. But that initial, that initial, um, they're called bleeds when they do that, when you put it in and it kind of, kind of bleeds or blooms. Um, and that, that to me is, is kind of the height of watercolor possibilities. So it's, it's a really nice feature of it. Now let's see. In this one, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it sort of wet into wet here. So I got a nice orange mix here. And if you notice in this orange flower, there's some, some darker areas and it looks like a, just a nice uh, red wash. We'll do the trick for that. And I'm gonna actually use this. This is um, a color that I, I believe is called alizarin crimson. It's sort of a darker red. So I'm just gonna bleed it in, in a few spots here and just kind of let the water take it, maybe thin it out a little bit. Let's see here, it's a little bit right along the fringe like that. But this is the part, you know, when you look at what, when I first looked at watercolors, I said, oh, wow, that looks so free and open and, uh, you know, kind of expressive and you're, you know, just laying in a lot of color. It's actually, it, if you look at a good watercolor stuff, you can see how meticulous they are with these kind of marks. You know, you look at this, you don't think, you don't think like super, you know, detail oriented, but you've got to be pretty precise about when you put that mark. If I put this in too early, it might spread too much and I might get a lot of, um, you know, just kind of, it might kill the orangeness around it, um, but it's starting to evaporate the water. And, and what that allows me to do is get a, a some degree of control um, with how far that bloom uh, takes you on your page. So I'm just kind of blotting in here, trying to get a read on where some of that is. All right, I kind of like that. Yeah, and as you get more familiar with this, you'll you'll start to you start to know and identify like when it's got when it's got the wetness of the water on there, it'll have different sheens. When it's got a ton of water, it'll be super shiny. Um, when it starts to dry out a little bit, it'll sort of be like kind of more of a satin finish, you know, like sort of in between a matte finish and a and a real wet finish. Um, and so you just gotta read that. And as you get more familiar with it, you'll go, oh, all right, this is sort of the uh, the happy witching hour when this paint is gonna kind of do what I have in mind for it. So like this this edge, you know, if I do that too late, it'll be just kind of a straight line and it'll look really forced. But, you know, right now, let's see if I can get even in, in closer there. Come on. I got an idea, I'll just lift it up, how about that? You know, you get all that texture and, and patterns and, you know, sort of those little tendrils coming out from the, where the two colors meet. Um, that's really something you can't get with any other medium. It is really a unique quality uh, of watercolor. And it's, it's what I like uh, most about watercolor, that, that ability to kind of let, let the water do the work, to do the good work for you. All right. And since I have this on here, I am just gonna go ahead and blot in those sort of lighter orange ones. And I think what I'll do up there is I'll just, I'll just wet it a little bit, do the wet into wet. These will be 
um, a little bit trickier because it's a lighter color. And it's very easy for, in this case, yellow uh, to kind of get overrun by anything else that uh, it leaks into. So you got to be really careful, though, especially those, those true yellow ones up on top. I'm, going, I'm kind of working my way back um, from the more intense, darker flowers up to the uh, up to the lightest ones. I mean, if and if you've taken any any watercolor classes, chances are any instructor or has told you, you know, work from light to dark. I'm not really doing that, <laughs> naughty me. But um, there's there is a method to that, and it actually does make a lot of sense. Um, you, you wouldn't normally do that with another medium, but uh, it does make sense with uh, with watercolor. And it's because those lighter colors, like if I were to come in here and, and, and come in here with some yellow, um, it would be really hard to overcome this orange and this red. So you, you kind of work from those, those weakest colors. So they have the, what's called the lowest tinting strength. Yellow is very easy to contaminate. Red's a little bit harder. Orange, not so bad. Blue is really hard to contaminate, but yellow is really easy to, to kind of have go sideways on you. So, um, Actually, I'm going to I'm going to do something else here. I'm going to start with just yellow and a little bit of this orange and I'm just going to block this in. I know it's not an orange flower or a yellow flower, but um, this is another way you can kind of mix colors with watercolors. Just start with one color and then add in the other color. It sort of adds a, a, a degree of um, Complexity to the color, it's not just sort of straight orange or straight red or whatever colors you're using. I'm just starting with kind of a root color of orange, orange being red and yellow mixed together. I'm gonna to start with the, the light root color here. Um, and do I go in with orange or do I go in with red? I'll try one, one of each. I'm gonna just, and if I'm gonna do, remember yellow being really, really vulnerable to other colors, I'm just gonna take a little bit of red and gonna dilute it with a fair amount of water. So it's kind of a washed out red a little bit, even a little bit more water. Let's see how that looks. Oh yeah, that looks nice. Sometimes, it almost looks like I know what I'm doing. So that's that's a really diluted red. And you can see how how quickly and how fully it it influences that that yellow. And then what I think I'm gonna do, I'll just I'll just keep it like that. Let's do that. And then I think what I'm gonna do next is I'll just try the orange and see the difference, just, just for an experiment here. All right, so here's orange. I think that orange is actually probably a little bit more accurate of a color, like this red and that yellow don't make this orange, um, but that's, that's fine. It's, this is sort of a getting to know you kind of thing. Doesn't have to be precise. All right. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little bit of this darker red right in the middle. This is really wet, so this might go a little bit too far, but we'll see. I'll just leave it. I'll just leave it like that. That's pretty good. That's roughly about where I want to be with that. Okay. So this red here is now pretty dry, so I'm going to go back to that. And I think what we've got here is, yeah, that's pretty dry. And so I'm gonna kind of wet this central little area here. It's, I've got this sort of orangish hue color over the, or in my water. If I was really worried about this color, um, 
contam or that water contaminating um, contaminating things. I might change my water, and you know if it, if it ever gets kind of out of hand, you, you definitely do it. If you're if there's any doubt, change your water. It can't hurt. So what I'm doing is I'm sort of pre-wetting in here, and you can see how this red is starting to leak in. That's just reactivated red from the 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 plant uh, petals there, the flower petals, and it's leaking in. That's totally normal and it's totally fine because there is going to be an interaction between these these two areas. And then there's a little bit over here. Looks like a little bit along the edge. So this this is almost like a purple red poppy. And now I'm going to take um, some blue. Um, I believe this is ultramarine blue. I could be wrong. Um, blues do blues to me are like the most because they're the strongest colors. It's you know it's a good idea to get a few blues up and running. I'm going to put just this. Did I freeze up here? Let's do this. There we go. It's too far over. Let me move this over a little bit so you can see that better. There we go. Let's just try. I'm going to try something here. No, I don't want to do that. I'm just getting a little blue here. I'm just going to start dabbing this right in the middle. It's not nearly dark enough, but better to sort of baby step it with blue because blue can be, like I said, a pretty, pretty strong color. Oh, that's a nice little bleed happening right there. You see how it's just kind of leaking into the rest of it, but hopefully only in the areas that I have pre-wet. Not hopefully, only. It's a known commodity. All right, this is starting to get a little darker. Now I have to confess here that Emil Nolda, the artist, actually painted these paintings on like a tr like a transparent pa uh, paper. It's uh, they're called uh, Japanese papers. They're made with like kozo kozo fibers, and 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 they're just a completely different type of um, uh, paper. And he would paint the front and the back. So it would be kind of this stained glass effect because you could literally see through the paper. Um, so we're trying our best with these more Western papers of, of real heavy stock. And there we go. It's starting to get a little darker. Maybe that'll be one of my uh, more advanced demonstrations later. We can do uh, Emil Nolda authentic Ooh, look at that. That is looking awesome. All these little veins right in here. Oh, that's really good. Let's put a little bit on here. Uh, where I kind of lost it a little bit. Oh, there it is. That's good. All right. I kind of like that. That's looking pretty good. It's not exactly the same colors that are on the Nolda, but you know, this is more of an idea of, of what this wet into wet process can do. Another thing you can do that, that's oftentimes pretty fun if you wanna go lighter is you can just take some water, just take a little bit of water and just kind of drop it in there. And it'll it sort of create this lighter bloom in the middle. We'll, we'll let that sit and see how, see how it goes. All right, now I'm going to start um, throwing in. Oh, let's do those yellows. Let's do the yellow up top. So I'll just start with these up here. Remember, if you got any questions, feel free. I'm just sitting here all alone by myself, talking to myself. So anybody's got any questions? All right, so I'm just pre-wetting these yellow flowers up top. This would be a good spring demo. 
There we go. And now you see how these two are right up against here. This is still a little wet. And because that water kind of formed this bridge, it's kind of leaking in there. But if you look at the, uh, the original over there in the corner, it looks like that's exactly what happened. You can kind of see a little bit of that orange has leaked up um, into, the, into the yellow of the daffodils. So I'm gonna go over here in this one first, since I'm not really too worried, famous last words, about it leaking anywhere. Oh, come on. Just one second, everyone. In the meantime, um, we do have a question. Um, yes, great. So are there any other techniques besides what on what? Yes, and I'm gonna show it here. We got uh, 19 minutes left and I will show it. Um, there's tons of little tricks um, that you can use with watercolor. I'm just gonna show you kind of the, the basic, how to, how to make marks kind of thing. Um, so it's not gonna be too complicated. I will do one. No, let's go the other way, come on. Um, that's got a little bit more like with salt and, you know, painting with, you know, different materials other than brushes and things like that. So I will get to that uh, later, but for the time being, I'm just um, concentrating on, on, you know, a brush making the mark and wet into wet is, is the one that uh, is really a lot of fun. All right, Perfect. so I'm just blocking these in. Um, so Doreen is asking, um, do you blot your brush on the paper towel after um, dripping it or dipping it in the water or do you just go straight to your, to your canvas? Um, most of the time I go straight to it, but, um, and, and I would probably be more diligent. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do more blotting when I do that other technique that I was gonna talk about. Um, but yes, that is a, I mean, as you go along, having a paper towel in one hand and the brush in the other is just sort of a natural thing that you'll that you'll develop because it is it is a really logical way to work with watercolor because there is so much water and sometimes there's too much water. Um, so you, you kind of have to be, uh, you know, on top of it. Otherwise, it'll it'll just sort of create this this little bit of a mess here. All right. So we got. Um, a little bit of a sort of orange center here. So I'm gonna just go right in here. A little bit of that. It looks like it's more or less the same. Everybody's familiar with the old daffodil color scheme there. I'll just leave that. Actually, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna put even a darker center in this one. And then the same right down in here. I may have done this too early, meaning there's probably too much water and it might just carry it out and get a little bit um, too washed out, but um, taking my chances. All right, so you were asking about uh, other techniques. I'll just go and show you how I would um, put this gre the green in and I'm not gonna pre-wet it. Um, I could but I'm not going to. Um, and it's, it's really just sort of a choice uh, on my part. So what I'm doing down here, let's see there, I'm gonna take a little bit of yellow, put it over here, and I'm gonna mix up a green. It is not the ideal green of these flowers, stems. Um, if I wanted to, a good blue to use, for getting a more vibrant green is something called Prussian blue, blue or cyan blue. Um, and it's, it's this really, it's a, it's a great color, but it's also a color that can really um, get acidic. Um, it's really bright. So let's try a little bit of it. There we go. So that's kind of a nice daffodil stem green. So I think I'll start with probably the driest area. Let's just put a couple of these in here. And I'm just gonna dry these on um, and not wet into wet, like I said. 
So appropriately enough, this is called dry brush. Just taking a dry, uh, that's, the brush is not dry, um, but the paper is. So you're, you're not relying on the water. You've got, you've got to control everything. All of your marks are controlled by, by you. And I'm just going to kind of draw like a, as if I were painting in oils or something like that. And this is actually a really good uh, indicator here. If you see that, um, you see how there's kind of like little dry spots in there, like right there, there, there. That's a really um, good indication. If you're looking at a painting, that that's how the artist works. It worked. They were they worked with a basically a, a dry brush or a dry paper when they applied it. So this is sort of a more traditional, um, usual way that um, people might be used to working. Takes a little bit more of that blue. So Mike, and what brush are you using right now? This brush is just a, a round and it's actually perfect for most everything that I'm using. Um, so it's a uh, size six. This is a brand called Sapphire. Um, and you know any any sort of decent round watercolor brush would probably be ideal. This is a fairly I'm working fairly small, and I wanted that so I could really concentrate my uh, my colors here. Um, so it's, it's it, well, it's small, but it's also it's it's a round, so it holds a lot of water. If you had something like a flat, let me show you this one here. This is a flat. These are okay, but they're really hard to make small marks with. The round is much better because it comes to a point, you get a little bit more detail, but it also has a lot of holding power uh, for, the, for the water. So you get, um, you get a nice uh, variety of marks with, with something like this. All right, now I'm gonna tempt fate and I'm just gonna try and, maybe I'll, I'll mess up on purpose. I don't really wanna do that, but I'll just go along this edge. Um, if I were worried that this were still wet, these flowers here, I would probably try and make a little bit of a, of a border around it. So there's, if you look, you can see it. There's a little gap between the green and the orange. Uh, oops, lost it. Let's go over there. Like right in here, I'm creating a little gap. If you're worried about it being wet in one place or another and leaking into the other place, that's a good way to do it. When it dries, you can come back and do it. Or if, you know, if I had more time, I would just wait. Um, but if you're, if you really want to, yeah, see, it's starting to leak a little bit out of there. If you really want to make sure that these, these areas stay separate, um, it's a good idea to wait until the area that you're working around is dry. Otherwise you run the risk of, you know, green leaking into orange, which, uh, you know, sometimes that can work and sometimes it doesn't work at all. So be forewarned. All right, let me go back to this blue since I'm out of that other one. And do you know um, the name of this painting, the original one? Um, you know, I don't know if he, if he actively named all of these. I mean, they, they would be just like, you know, poppies and daffodils and stuff like that. So um, I don't know it offhand. My guess is that if anybody named it, it was not Emil Nolda because he was too busy just cranking these things out. I mean, he made tons of these paintings and they're really, they're really beautiful. And he was really kind of captivated by all the color possibilities and so you can see the level of detail you can get just by that, that last little mark that I made there um, without that water to kind of carry it around and potentially make a mess. Um, you, you do have a, a degree of control over this. So I'm getting sort of a variety, a few, a few different types of greens here that last you know, this one up here is a little bit more of a yellow green. This is more of a kind of a forest green or a deeper green, or maybe more of a flower petal or flower stem green. So I'm just gonna kind of layer them a little bit. 
Now, one thing that you'll notice is mine, mine, the intensity of the color here is not as, um, it's not as intense as in Milnola. And that's because he's in Milnola and I'm not, but it's also because I haven't done, you know, too many more layers uh, of red and of yellow and of orange. Um, and I actually do have a little bit of time so I can, I can show you hopefully how that, that works. Let's just get that. And Mike, any recommendation um, to keep the paper from rippling? Um, yes, tape it down. Mine's, mine's buckling like that a little bit, but it's not horrible. I mean, the, the worst case scenario is you, you, you form these little troughs and the water just kind of sinks down into that. The, the tape will uh, help with that. Um, and then once it all dries, it will dry more or less flat, you know, fingers crossed, obviously, but it's, um, it's really imperative that you use tape when you're, when you're painting. I mean, you can get away with it, uh, but, you know, chances are it's, it's going to do some things that you don't want it to do. So tape it is the quick answer. All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just come in here. This is the one uh, that, that is still, I'm going to do this one because this is all pretty dry here. So I'm going to come back. I'm going to re-wet this. And this will sort of open that paint up again. I mean, this is another good, bad feature. You know, it's like some people like it, some people don't. Um, of watercolor. I'm going to actually do this middle part as well. But even after the paint has dried fully, if you put water on it, it will you know, it will start to sort of activate a little bit again. Um, so you got to be aware of that. Like, I'm not going to go over this too many times because I'll lose all these nice textures here. So what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to take this orange and maybe put a tiny dab of red in it just to get it a little bit darker and a little bit more intense. And then I'm just going to layer another level of orange over it. And so what that'll do is it'll just sort of sit on top of it like a, you know, kind of a, a glaze over it, over the previous work that I'd done. And once again, I'm just dabbing here. If you start going like that, if you start rubbing up against the, uh, the previous layers, sometimes it can lift it up. The, the friction will kind of take care of it. And Yeah, that's, that's sort of adding a, a, a degree of intensity. And, and what I mean by intensity is how bright it is, how, um, how orange that flower is. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a measure of, you know, how much more orange could I get it or how much more red could I get that one? This one's pretty intense, but I definitely think I could, you know, up it a degree or two, just looking at uh, Anolda's original here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to tempt fate yet again. I'm going to take this blue and put it in the middle here and hope it doesn't spread too much. It seems to be staying relatively good, but I've got a lot of water around here. So I have a feeling that this is going to sort of bleed maybe a bit too much. And if it does that, then I can just say, that's what I intended to do because I wanted to show you how not to get into trouble with that. Yeah, it's starting to leak a little bit. That's not too bad. And then I'll just take a really, really saturated blue and just put it right in the middle. And hopefully it'll behave itself. All right. Okay, we're winding down here. People want to maybe show their work real quick before we sign off? Yes. Just before we do that, um, two questions yeah. in one sort of about the material. Yeah. So what tape and paint set are you using? Um, the tape is just sort of standard masking tape. It doesn't have to be anything special. Some people like to use like that, um, what painters use, like that blue tape. 
Um, and that tends to peel off. The, the one problem you can have with masking tape is when you peel it off, it can sometimes take up some of the paper and kind of leave like a raggedy edge. Um, I tend not to worry too much about that because generally speaking, that area, if you're gonna put it on the wall or you know frame it or something like that, that part's gonna get covered. Um, so yeah, the tape is, is really just sort of standard masking tape or the painter's tape. And then the, the next question was about the, the, the paint set, yeah. Yeah, the type of paint. So I used, um, I used a little bit of a variety, but I, mostly what I used is these little Artist Loft brand and they actually work great. Um, I, I mean, I think this whole, this three trays of them here, let me just go for a wide view. I didn't get the background, um, but I got you the stuff that I wanted to see. So there's one, two, and then there's one more tray. So there's three trays of these. Um, the good thing about these brands and, you know, I'm not trying to, pump the Michael stuff too much here, but um, this is their brand. So it's sort of in store and they don't have to pay a lot for advertising and stuff like that because it's just sort of in their stores all the time. Um, so they're, they're very competitively priced and the quality of pigment is actually, you know, pretty good. So um, yeah, that's a, that's a nice little feature of these. Um, I will say that these, these kind of cheaper brand, um, uh, watercolor paints don't have as quite as intense a pigment um, like this red. It, they, they didn't have the right red in this set for, for whatever reason. And I got, um, I can't even remember what the brand was. It may have been like a Daniel Smith or something like that. Here, here it is. It is, it's just Windsor Newton actually. Um, this is the Windsor red. So this one is a, uh, let's see if it says what grade it is. Series one, usually there's with paints, you're looking at uh, student grade and artist grade or professional grade. This is probably a professional grade and this generally has more pigment load to it. So it's gonna be more intense. It's gonna be brighter. Um, and, that, and that will just make things brighter. Like this red here is really nice and intense. This is actually two layers of that, that orange and that's actually doing really well. Yeah, okay. We do have quite a number of people asking about the background. Will you be going over that in a future class or do you have any recommendations for those who want to finish it? And also, how do you protect the project when you're done? When you're done, um, I, with watercolors is kind of tricky. There, there is, I think a new product, you know, sort of like a varnish that you can uh, put over it once it's dry, um, but I'm not, I've never used it. I'm not really sure how good it is. Um, but the thing to do with anything on paper, if you, if you want, if you care about it and you want it to keep, uh, for any amount of time is either frame it or mat it or put it in a flat file away from, you know, direct sunlight and, and all that sort of thing. Um, as far as the background goes, I can actually do that really. I'll just give you, I'll give you a start on the background of how I would do it. I'd probably go with a bigger brush. Um, this is a Filbert brush. Um, and it's starting to fall apart. It's, it's probably like a size 10 as it compared to this was a size, this one was a size six. Um, and so I'm just gonna, I'll just do this little corner here to give you an idea of, of how I would approach the background. I'm just gonna pre-wet it, not super soaked. And then it looks like this color is what's called Payne's gray. Um, and Payne's gray is, 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 a, is, a, um, is a color that was essentially invented by a watercolorist, this guy named Payne, P-A-Y-N-E-S. And I'm just gonna kind of dab, and that looks to be a pretty good match as to what was going on. I'm also gonna sort of add a little water as I go and just kind of move it around, kind of keep it around. If you look all around here, my guess is actually, this is the way Nolda did this because I kind of see these little this little halo around all the flowers. So he probably did something exactly like I was doing. Once again, that was my intention. I wanted to do exactly what Nola would have intended. All right. So I'm just kind of blotting it. It's not a real even um, application, um, but there is a general sort of, it gets dark along the fringe and then gets a little bit lighter as you get closer to the, uh, the bouquets of flower. And now I'm just taking a little bit of the 
the actual dirt, dirty water there. Oh, I forgot my little stems up here. Sorry. So just kind of blotting that in. I really don't think he used much more than Payne's Gray in that background. So I'm just going to go with that. I'm not going to even mix anything else. And, and Payne's Gray, it says it's gray. But to me, to my eye, it's kind of got this sort of purplish, bluish tint to it. It's not like a sort of a perfect middle of the road, completely neutral color. Look at this, this is the world's record for a background. We're only a minute over time too. But feel free to post, um, post your work on social media with those tags. What were they again? Uh, make it with Michael's and do you remember those, Jimena? Michael's classes, yes. Michael's classes, okay, yeah, great. So yeah, just throw them up there. And... I will put those in the chat. Awesome. All right, look at that. Ask and you shall receive. It was a little bit of a panic background, but it's there. And I think it's pretty pretty spot on. So yeah, that, that Payne's gray is a really good color to kind of keep in your back pocket. Any, any sort of prepared um, uh, set of, of watercolors will have Payne's gray in it because it is such an iconic. The British, um, Painters of like the late uh, 1700s, early 1800s were real innovators and really ones as far as the, as the West, you know, Western painting goes uh, of getting watercolor kind of taken seriously. And so all these early watercolors, John Constable and J.M.W. Turner and, and Cotman and, and other people like that, um, they were the ones, oh, Appropriately enough, it's gone, it's gone sideways. They were the ones who um, made a lot of innovations and and gave uh, watercolor a, a real strong boost into kind of the mainstream of of materials. So there we go. I would I would probably come back and intensify some of these. This is a risky proposition. Now this is what happens. Uh, I'll I'll just let it happen. Watch right here. You see how it just ran, it just ran right out. I had a little puddle and now it's gonna go right down. You gotta watch out for gravity. Gravity is not your friend in watercolor. It will streak and run um, if it's not dry and that is not dry. So, but it's kind of creating a cool little texture. Okay, thank you all. And um, uh, again, sorry for the uh, slight confusion there, but um, for the next, I believe, three or four classes, uh, we will be working in watercolor. And then I will get back uh, to this painting uh, in oils. And, and that will be our first um, of, of many uh, that we'll do in, in oils uh, down the line. OK, folks, thank you all again. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry we didn't get to sh show your work. Um, but we'll uh, maybe bring it next week and we can have a look at it. All right. I'll post them Thank on you all, media. folks. And Mike, you got so many great comments. People who were scared of watercolor are not, now no longer afraid. Lots of um, neat tips and tricks. So thank you so yep. much for another great class. Thank awesome. you everyone who joined us today and see you next week. All right. Thank you all. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.